Welcome to this 1000 subscriber special for my YouTube channel. I'd like to say thank you very much to the people that have subscribed and watched my videos. I um, also appreciate the kind comments and I do try and read all the comments and reply to them. Yeah, I do really enjoy helping people out and teaching people. I'm passionate about sewing machines and especially older machines. I don't really get into the history of the machines that much, but mainly just the mechanical side of things. A common question I get asked by my uh, customers, my local customers here in the area, is how I got into repairing sewing machines. And um, the answer to that is uh, straight out of school I had the opportunity to do a, um, it was a trial for a company in Dunedin in New Zealand here called Arthur Ellis. And they manufactured the uh, brand Fairy Down. And they were famous for uh, sleeping bags. And in fact, they supplied a sleeping bag to Sir Edmund Hillary for his ascent of Everest in 1951, was it? Um, yeah, so they were big into sleeping bags, uh, duvets, mattress protectors, things like that. So I went in uh, while I was still at school and had a look around and I was quite impressed with all the machinery and whatnot and I was quite interested in mechanical, uh, the mechanical side of things. There were machines there that were run by hydraulics, uh, computer controlled, so there was electronics which is also a hobby of mine. And um, that was quite appealing to me so I took the apprenticeship, it's actually an apprenticeship, three years in uh, New Zealand here. So that's an industrial sewing machine mechanic, it's a three year apprenticeship. And that's yeah mainly industrial. I didn't really get into domestics until later. So I uh, carried out my apprenticeship there and um, I mentioned my other hobbies and funnily enough uh, one of my other hobbies actually tied in directly with one of the uh, big quilting machines that they had there that uh, was wider than a king size duvet and well the bed of it was, the actual machine was even wider that, than that because there was a little computer station off to one side and if I can find a photo of something similar I'll uh, put it up. So the bed was wider than a king size and they'd have rolls of fabric in front of the machine, one horizontally in front of the machine, you know, could be as wide as a king if not uh, a little bit wider and uh, then so they'd have the lower piece of fabric on a roll they'd have another roll with a um, Dacron which was also uh, manufactured on site and then another roll on top of normal fabric to so that you've got the three layers you've got the two layers of fabric with the Dacron sandwiched in between and that would get fed through the bed of this machine and the needle bar of this machine is wider than a king size uh, duvet and this needle bar was just like a it was literally a bar straight bar really wide it could take 200 needles so you could if you wanted to you could populate every single slot with a needle and get 200 needles and that's um, across the duvet if you like but we normally only had about um, a dozen maybe so if you divide a king size uh, duvet into 12 or 8 it might have been uh, equal spaces we would have a needle in each one of those positions um, but it was capable of taking 200 and of course each needle had its own looper as well so as the fabric was being fed through the carriage could also move sideways so if it was feeding and your carriage was just going back and forth like that it would create a zigzag pattern instead of the needle bar zigzagging like that to get a zigzag the actual um, material is being moved rather than the needle bar as such. The needle bar is going up and down but the needle bar is stationary and it's um, what we would call the x-axis 
and that would create your design. So you could have like a big zigzag pattern or you could actually program it to do uh, circles or squares and that was done by moving the carriage uh, laterally and also feeding forward and back on the rollers. So the combination of the two you could get all sorts of different patterns. This was all computer controlled so uh, the computer would say okay if the pattern's going to be a big zigzag you know like that it would say uh, drive the carriage to the left and then drive it to the right and then left again while it was feeding through but you could also tell it to feed forward and feed reverse so you could as say create circles and the funny thing was getting back to my passion for um, collecting old uh, calculators and um, my other hobbies um, dad brought back a this is an HP 41C he brought this back from uh, Singapore and it's a programmable calculator and it just happened to be that this the language that this was programmed in was uh, near identical to this quilting machine program language so um, yeah, I, I got a bit of kudos because um, there was no one there at the time that could uh, program this or change the program. They just had a standard program that came, uh, that they requested from the manufacturer. It was some uh, European manufacturer, I can't remember where it came from, but uh, the program that was delivered to them with the machine, they wanted to change. They wanted to go from a big zigzag to just little circles and um, this little... Uh, computer station on the side of the machine it had a little printer and it pr printed out the program and, it, and I looked at it and I thought well that's the same as this um, programmable calculator language I could um, decipher it so instead of them having to um, uh, get support from Europe which you know back in the days before the internet this is probably 1987 um, it would probably be a telephone call and uh, not sure how they would have got the program through. I guess they could have posted it, handwritten it, posted it, printed a listing, something like that. Anyway, um, I edited the program there on the spot. Yeah, I got quite a bit of kudos for that. And that was really just because of my other hobby, my initial hobby um, as, a, as a kid, just with calculator programming in general, really, calculators. My other interest um, back then, still is now, is old computers. You know, I mentioned that um, I like old things. Well, I like old computers and old calculators and old sewing machines and typewriters and radios and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but this uh, little computer here, that's another uh, was another hobby of mine back in the day. A little eight-bit uh, computer you could program yourself and play games on, things like that. So. Um, that's just some of the rundown on some of my hobbies. So yeah, the, the, those hobbies there um, are still with me today. I still mess around with old computers and calculators and things. So I restore them, mainly just get them back up and running and um, maintain them, things like that. Similar to what I do with some of my old sewing machines. And I've got a little collection of sewing machines. One here you can see Beside me here, this is a 301A, um, a really nice uh, machine. It's bigger than the featherweight, if people are familiar with the featherweight. It's it's a wider bed. Um, this machine is actually made for the American market. Um, but yeah, really neat looking sort of art deco design. I'll give you a closer look at that um, in a little bit. So yeah, I, I collect all sorts of bits and pieces and um, so try and keep these in sort of in reasonable uh, condition, you know, keep them reasonably tidy and, and uh, well maintained obviously. Um, but yeah, get, getting back to the um, my first job, uh, yeah, so the, the quilting machine was very interesting. They had mechanical type quilting machines there as well. rather than using hydraulics to move the bed and feed the fabric, they used um, big cams, big metal cams. And they were big old stamping sort of machines. They were really noisy. The operators wore, wore head phone, um, ear protection when operating those. Um, there were 
three, I think three of those, and this modern computer-controlled um, quilting machine in the one room. It, you walk through there without hearing protection, and uh, you'd know about it. Yeah, they had all sorts of um, other specialised machinery as well. Uh, but the main thing I worked on there was um, they had FAF uh, automatic plane sewers, so the plane sewer would auto backstitch, um, foot lift automatically, and needle position, automatic needle positioning. Uh, 463, I think the model was of those, FAF 463. Uh, they, so they were electronically controlled, they had servo motors um, and the other main machine there was a five thread overlocker. So that was kind of my introduction to sewing machines as such and um, so I took on the apprenticeship, uh, completed that apprenticeship uh, in Christchurch when they moved the head office from Dunedin to Christchurch and um, in Christchurch they were doing, uh, they were really ramping things up, they had this conveyor system that would um, drop down to the operator and the operator would do their job, uh, their piece work, whatever it may be, and clip the sleeping bag on to this hook and it would convey on this sort of plastic type chain link linkage up to uh, another big uh, linkage uh, overhead and it would transport so it would come up from the operator and link onto this other uh, overhead system and transport the sleeping bag to the next operator whoever that was and it was all programmed as well so it couldn't obviously just end up at a random operator because they were all the machines were all set up for different jobs so from one machine to another had to be programmed so you had a source and a destination as such address in this system so uh, the yeah, the electronics and the computer programming uh, side of things was getting starting to ramp up at that stage in the sort of late 80s, early 90s. And they also made um, tramping packs at the Christchurch factory um, and also tents. So a lot of twin needle machines for the tents. The packs, they used a lot of very heavy uh, duty walking foot machines. And... Um, yeah, so it was it was an interesting job, and at that stage, um, when I finished my apprenticeship, I moved to another company doing workwear, and so yeah, I went around a few uh, companies in Christchurch, um, and got exposed to more and more machine, different machinery at different places, because a lot of the machinery in the, in the industrial side of it is very specialised. The machines designed for one specific job, and then um, I took a job on uh, for Singer. I sort of branched out into repairing domestics and that was an after work job so um, maybe only twice a week or whenever they needed me. So that um, got me exposed to domestic sewing machines. In our area uh, here in the top of the South Island in New Zealand there's not a lot of manufacturing um, anymore, there's not a lot of uh, sewing factories and whatnot that moved offshore uh, generally to China obviously. Uh, there's still the odd one dotted around, but it's the industrial side of things has definitely taken a, um, a bit of a hit there. So I decided to um, branch out into mainly repairing domestics, and that's obviously what mainly my channel is based on. I don't really have the room uh, at home to set up industrial machines as such. I get the odd one from time to time, but I don't do a lot with those. And then I decided to uh, put some things on YouTube and um, yeah just sort of tried to build the channel up by creating videos reasonably regularly uh, I try to do them every week if I can sometimes um, there are things that stop me from doing that I have a uh, part-time job three days a week as a computer technician so you know that can keep me reasonably busy and then the other two days a week I uh, put into sewing machine repair for my local customers here. The other thing I want to do is show you uh, some of my collection and as I say here's the beautiful Singer 301A. This is one of the pride and joys of my sewing machine collection, the 301A, designed for the American market and I just really like the aesthetic 
of this machine. It, um, I like the lines, you know, these sort of straight lines, it's Art Deco style, the matte black, and this, you know, really nice uh, sort of gold labeling here really goes well with the matte black. And just the, the patterns, you know, this Art Deco style. In fact, it actually reminds me of a um, almost like a locomotive or something, you know, of of the day. It's got that sort of aesthetic, and uh, it's a really nice machine. Very nice to use. Um, nice and smooth. Very robust. Well made and uh, reliable machine. It runs on 110 volts, so. Yeah, obviously uh, made for the American market. Our voltage here is 240 so I need a step down transformer to take it from 240 to 110. So that's just a, uh, an extra thing I have to put in line with the, the plug here. But um, that's no, no big deal. And a fairly simple machine. Just a straight sew, straight sewer. Uh, you know, ten tension control here, stitch length, reverse, and bob and winder here. So it's a fairly basic machine, but very nice. And that is the uh, wide throat. It's got the wider throat here and a little extension table for a little bit of extra work area here. And this is, you know, a bigger machine than its uh, little sister, which is the featherweight. The little sister to its big brother over here. This is the triple two K featherweight. The main differences between this triple two K and the two two one K is that the triple two K here has a removable flatbed, so you can remove this flatbed like so, and. That gives you the free arm functionality, which is quite handy. And you can see the rotary hook in the end there. And the other difference between the this model and the 221K featherweight is this has a drop feed mechanism. So just this little lever here drops the feed dog so you can attach a free motion uh, quilting embroidery foot darning you know and um, just a simple switch there and this again is a fairly basic straight sewing machine with a tension dial here just an on off switch for your light stitch length and reversing lever and bob and winder over here again a, a really nice machine aesthetically very pleasing really cute my other half, she, she doesn't sew, but she's quite keen to learn. And she did learn at school, um, you know, did the basics, but she hasn't done anything since. You know, we, she often comments on this machine, and, and I think possibly this might be the one that she learns on. I don't know yet. Um, it, it really comes down to personal preference. I made a quilt on this machine, and I did a lesson to start with where... We did a, a piecing lesson, so putting, uh, make, cutting out the squares and putting them together and creating the quilt top. But we ran out of time in the in the course, and um, it was only a day course. So I had this quilt top, but I and the other bits and pieces, the batting and whatnot. Um, but I had no idea how to put it back together. So I approached the ladies at a quilting group here in Mochuaca, and they graciously accepted me into their inner sanctum and um, yeah they were really helpful really lovely ladies so they basically just helped me with um, you know putting the quilt together really and um, that was greatly appreciated because I had no idea what I was doing and I learned a lot from those ladies and they were very friendly and very helpful so um, I appreciate that and I used this machine here for the entire quilt um, and the nice thing about this machine is when doing the uh, the piecing 
together of the quilt top. You know, this was very good with uh, piecing together because there was not any ply shift at all. And some people will know what I'm talking about with ply shift. So as I was sewing the pieces together, uh, when you get to the end, you the you know the idea is to have the two pieces of material even at the end of the seam where they butt together. So quite often, what can happen is you get a little bit of ply shift where one piece of material, probably the bottom more than likely, will pull in further, and the top piece will get pushed uh, towards you, and you'll end up at the end of the seam where it's not even. This machine was amazing. I didn't really even have to do any easing or anything like that. I didn't even have to pin the two pieces of uh, material together. I just uh, ran them through and away it went. So really uh, good in that respect. A few of the people sort of thought, well, maybe I should be using a walking foot when I'm putting the quilt together, doing the actual quilting, uh, which probably would have made things easier. But uh, I did manage with this machine and the, and the way I handled it was I just released the foot pressure uh, drop the foot pressure off as far as it could go without it sort of getting too unstable underfoot here and, and slipping and um, if I had that pressure up fairly light um, even when I was sewing the quilt together with the batting and the two layers um, this machine handled it really well even without a walking foot so I was really impressed with um, the capabilities of this machine yeah, it's just a really nice little machine to have in the collection and I've, I've also got the 221 uh, model as well. Sticking with the older machines, I picked this machine here up from an op shop locally or a, a thrift store. Uh, this machine interested me because it's a 201P and I wasn't sure what the P stood for but I did a little bit of reading it's made in Penrith, Australia, which is uh, west of Sydney by the look of it. So uh, the parts were all manufactured in the UK and then the parts were shipped out to Australia and assembled there. So this is an Australian machine. And um, the other main difference is that the wooden case is made from Australian wood, Australian sourced wood and made in Australia as well. That's almost identical to a 201 K23 as far as I understand. It's in the it's a sort of browny, fawny colour with the brown accents and you know the, the op shops cut the foot controller cable because uh, of potential electrical safety issues. Um, but that's no problem, I've got another controller I can fit to this machine. So yeah, 201K, uh, sorry, 201P. The 201 series of machine was made from 1935 to 1961. So, you know, they had a really good long manufacturing time and um, obviously very popular and very well made. Still going strong today. There's not much to go wrong mechanically with these machines. They're very robust. Another very nice uh, little machine there. And here we're getting into something a little bit more modern. This is uh, my 726. Uh, this machine is quite special to me because I learnt to sew on this machine. Although uh, I knew how to sew as such because as a mechanic you, um, when you're testing the machines you kind of have to know how to, you know, uh, sew the basics anyway. I knew all those sort of real basic things, but I didn't actually know how to sew. Um, like I, I couldn't have made a shirt before then. So I got professional lessons, and this is the machine that I used. I made my first shirt on this one. Um, and these are really nicely made, you know, German made machine, very good quality, nice smooth machine. And um, that, so that's quite special to me, this one and uh, I still would use that today for sewing. In fact, if my other half wants to learn, I possibly might teach her on this one. So that is one in the collection. I've also got a 766 as well. And I'm going to be doing a, a buyer's guide to the 700 series singers, just a few little things to look out for.
In the wings I've got um, how to use one of these machines, an in-depth use video. One of my favourite machines, this one as well. So, uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much it for the, that's part of my collection. I do have quite a few other different types of machines and quite often you'll see on YouTube videos that I've created, some of those machines actually belong to my collection as well. So that's it for the 1000 subscriber special. Thanks again to my subscribers and the people that uh, leave the comments on the YouTube videos. Uh, so I really enjoy doing these videos, so um, expect to see more and thank you very much for watching.